There is something new to record every day about the national customs, history, geography and products of Western countries. The source books that I am using, although written only seven or eight years ago, and in some cases fifteen or sixteen years ago, are concerned with matters dating no later than fifty or sixty years ago. They are thus lacking in contemporary information, for which we must await the appearance of newer books. In a certain work, America is said to mean New World in some European tongue. According to one opinion, America was discovered by a subject of the King of Portugal, called Americus, from whom the name was derived. According to another opinion, this land was first discovered by a man of Genoa, Italy, named Columbus. Hence, this land should be called Columbia. The inhabitants are of several races, and customs differ according to locality, but they all make no distinction of class, literally, between noble and mean. In the southern part of that land, the people live by tilling the soil. In the north, the people manufacture diverse sorts of things. Some of them carry on trade in all directions, going most frequently to Europe, to the east, and West Indies, and to China, it is said. Although this country is merely a part of America, it is so large in area, its people are so numerous, and its vigour is so pronounced, that it is commonly referred to simply as North America. It was formerly just a vast wilderness without even having a name. About the year 1683, Englishmen colonised Carolina, in the southern part of this land. Then, in the year 1734, they sent several hundred thousand colonists to New York and Connecticut, it is said. Some years later, several tens of thousands of Englishmen, who refused to subscribe to the tenets of the Anglican Church, were arrested and sent to this distant country. These people lacked sufficient food and clothing at that time, but they privately rejoiced because there were no rulers in this land. A number of years later, their descendants came to number over 300,000, and the products of the land became extremely bountiful. During our Horeki period, England was at war for some years. The people became sorely enfeebled, and the loss in foreign trade was not at all inconsiderable. The English sought, therefore, to employ the people of this land, America and use them for their own ends. The people of this land, however, resented their abusive language and scorned their cheap wages and refused to obey their orders. They even seized and threw into the sea some 342 boxes of tea that had been brought from India by the English. In great wrath, the English dispatched a number of warships and blockaded the most important port of this land, the people found themselves in most desperate straits, and officials of the thirteen states assembled to ponder the situation. A military official named Washington and a civil official named Franklin promptly stood up and declared, We must not lose this heaven-given opportunity. We must sever relations with the English forever. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. So, quick update from Coco, who's been good enough to learn Japanese to help translate some sources for the channel. Ogenki desu ka? Ogenki desu ka? Luckily, mine and Coco's recommendation this week doesn't require her newly acquired polyglottism, as it is in English and is about the pilgrims who travelled to the Americas all that time ago. A fantastic look into the experience of travelling on the Mayflower, and a great counterpoint to the Japanese perspective presented in this video. Magellan is always a great choice if you want more context for our videos. It's basically a very bingeable Netflix for documentaries. It has the widest range of history content available anywhere, among lots of other genres. Click on the link in the description for an exclusive month-long free trial for Voices of the Past viewers. Thanks.
George Washington died on December the 14th, 1800. He was a North American burgher, a term applied to puissant folk living in towns and combining the three professions of war, agriculture and commerce, who became a general. That age produced many heroes of whom he was the greatest. He was born in Fairfax, Virginia, one of the Republican states, in the year 1734. His father was a big farmer in this town. His grandfather was a man of England who, 60 years previously, had fled civil war in his native land and had come to this country to live. As a child, he observed the rules of his family. He entered a school at Williamsburg, the name of a place. That place was formerly the capital of Virginia. He was by nature wise and progressed rapidly in his studies, becoming particularly well-versed in mathematics. After a time, he left the city school and returned to his homestead, where he worked at farming. In his spare moments, he studied battle tactics. In the year 1752, France built a fort in Ohio, the name of a place in North America, and England, becoming angry, attacked it, but no decisive result was obtained. An English governor-general who had come to Virginia now ordered Washington to negotiate peace terms with the French general. This was not accomplished, but he ascertained in great detail the exact situation of the enemy. The English general made Washington a major and ordered him to proceed to Ohio at the head of 800 troops from Virginia. With his few troops, he fought bravely against the strong foe. An English official named Braddock arrived in Virginia with troops in the year 1755, and Washington joined his forces as the leader of a detachment with the rank of adjutant, an officer who supervises everything in a military camp. Washington commanded a band of troops whose duty it was to loot enemy provisions, and his spirited fighting greatly enhanced his fame and caused all his associates to respect him. In the year 1759, Washington resigned from his command. He married a woman of high birth and returned to his homestead. There he devoted himself to his regular calling as a burgher. He studied most sedulously. Events occurred in the year 1776 that caused the colonists in North America to hate their mother country, England and Washington voluntarily used his wealth to equip troops. On April the 19th, 1778, at the Battle of Lexington, the name of a place, his side suffered many casualties. On May the 10th that year, a meeting was held in Philadelphia, the name of a place, and troops were raised in the various states. Washington was chosen commander-in-chief by common acclaim, and he devoted himself to affairs of state in this time of national difficulty. Military supplies were not ample, and troops had been acting as they pleased, without obeying any rules. But he was extremely strict towards the army and impartial. As opportunities arose, he led his troops in attacks on the enemy and gradually saved the country from its peril, and established peace and order. But he undertook no unorthodox scheme, nor did he hazard any project that depended on good for successful fruition. In the spring of that year, 1778, an English general named Howe was defeated by Washington. He fled from Boston, but with many troops, and administered severe defeats on various armies. Washington, however, being very cautious, left that place quickly and was the only one to preserve his army intact. He adopted the good tactics of avoiding a frontal clash with the enemy, preferring to wait for some favourable opportunity. Later, his plans working out well, he crushed the Hessian troops at Trenton and defeated an English general at Princeton. The aggressive power of the American forces became greatly enhanced, bringing fear to the English and winning renown throughout the world. In the year 1780, they captured an English army at Saratoga. France came to the assistance of the Americans and final victory was achieved. 
All this was due to Washington's great ability. The English now realised it was impossible to win the submission of the Americans, and peace negotiations were started. A peace conference was held in Paris. Paris is the capital of France, and the conference was held there probably because the French had helped the Americans. The home country finally became an independent nation. Washington now resigned from his command. His associates, appreciating his great services and esteeming his virtue, tried hard to keep him from leaving, but he was adamant and returned to his homestead in Virginia. Here he lived in quiet solitude for a year or two. Peace had been secured, but no system of government had been established, and there was no unanimity of public opinion. Owing to the gravity of the situation, a general meeting was held in Philadelphia. Everyone asked that Washington became high official. Hence, unable to help it, he again looked after the affairs of government. He established institutions and issued laws which were so well designed that they are still in force today. The next year, another assembly was convened, and Washington was named highest official, Saijokan, for a term of four years. When this term came to an end, he was asked to serve for yet another period of four years. He was resourceful and conscientious in his administration. In the country, there was a person called Hamilton, who was wise, eloquent, and well-versed in political matters. So, he was chosen by Washington to assist the latter in governing. Boris Uteto, the name of a Westerner, says that when the Republican government was established in the country, the people were greatly exhausted, but that Washington was in office for eight years and managed the affairs of state so well that there was excellent military preparedness, the nation prospered, the people enjoyed peace, and the country's renown encompassed the earth. This is quite true. The nation's good reputation was re-established, its trade was revived, and a dilapidated country was reborn as a newly risen nation. The national debt was no longer regarded as unpayable, every family prospered, men worked diligently, production greatly increased, and the government's revenue grew and grew. The people were governed by law, and not by individuals. Their customs were benevolent, and they behaved like persons of high birth. Europeans all marvelled at the excellence of the governmental organisation. Boris Uteto, commenting on him, says, Washington was circumspect and discreet in managing matters, so his achievements are not so well known as Hamilton's in the realm of government. Washington's name will be established in history forever. Yet, in his day there were some people who made slanderous charges against him, he was deeply hurt by this, and when his term had been fulfilled, in the year 1798, he returned, with relief, to his homestead. There he lived in simplicity, after the manner of the sages, apart from the world. Washington died at the age of 67. There was none among the people of this republican nation who did not mourn his death, and even people of other lands showed great sorrow. His name was therefore given to the capital, to perpetuate the memory of his achievements. When about to die, he prepared a will, freeing his slaves, giving a large sum of gold to the government, establishing a college in Colombia, a place name differing from Colombia in South America, and founding a school for the poor in a certain place. His mausoleum is in Mount Vernon, his villa. The people have not yet put up any monument to this great man, nor even a tombstone with an inscription recording his achievements. His name, however, has an imperishable place in history, obviating the necessity of a tombstone. Nothing more could one ask. Washington had a dignified bearing. He was an able official and a manly burgher. He was circumspect in his actions and undaunted in the face of great difficulties. His devotion to his country was indomitable. His guiding principle was the preservation of national honour. 
He cherished his country, gave prosperity to its people, and was ever ready to serve others. He always had a sound basis for his views, but never sought to force these views on others. In managing affairs, he was strict, but benignant. This was his heaven-endowed nature, truly worthy of respect and adulation. He was an exceptional man, born to do great things and to achieve success and distinction. <laughs>